Hi, welcome back. This is the second part of uh, the Green Chemistry Lecture for CM4269. And I think this will be a fair bit shorter than the previous one, I hope. OK, so we spent the last 40 minutes talking about the 12 principles and uh, thinking about why and what the basis is and what the metrics might be to measure some of them. Um, now let's move on to some of the implications. The application of the 12 principles actually logically and inevitably leads to two things. One is intensification, which means you're doing things more intensely. And the other leads to reduction, which means you are reducing, be it waste, impacts, amount of reagents, um, damage, all of those sorts of things, and actually <laughs> uh, expense as well. So it's uh, uh, very much uh, a business, uh, something which should not be an alien to a business person, or to us actually. Okay, this little diagram I've lifted from Manahan, and basically all of the 12 principles are around the edge. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and they've They've bundled a, a few in together. And you can see by logical application of each of these principles, one gets reduction in either cost, waste, energy, materials, plant, risk and hazard, VOCs. Together then, there's reduced environmental impact. Let's look at a very simple example. Um, this is the classic route, the so-called chlorohydrin route, to uh, synthesize ethylene oxide. Um, I, I won't worry you with the chemistry. You basically get chlor um, in this system. You get uh, attachment across the double bond of chlorine and a hydroxide uh, with formation of HCl. Uh, then you move the HCl using calcium ox hydroxide, absorb it, and you end up with your product. Um, if you look at the overall reaction here, your atom utilization is only 25%. The vast majority of the molecular mass that you've put into that, actually, um, you've lost. Again, we, we talked about waste already. Um, generally, if you're looking for high atom efficiency, you look for rearrangements, maybe pericyclic reactions, redox reactions. If you're looking at low atom efficiency, then substitution type reactions, elimination reactions, things like that. OK, so let's now put the modern route up, which is actually using um, a catalyst with oxygen. Um, atom utilization is 100%. Uh, this reaction uh, runs cooler, so you're saving energy. Um, and clearly, because you've not got all of these waste products, not only are you making a, a, a good uh, you're also good saving in terms of the environment, you're also saving money. Pardon me, sorry. You're saving money um, as well. So, all of these uh, lead to basically safer chemistry. They lead to more economic chemistry. And they lead to uh, greater intensity. The action, if you like, is concentrated here in one step. It's very intense, rather than being spread out over two steps. OK. So what I'd like to do now is walk you through each stage of this diagram. And it's, if you like, how green chemistry can be a reduction process, is a reduction process, particularly in terms of waste. So, 
We start off with our original process, our feed going into a reactor, producing product and waste. Okay, the first stage in source reduction is to actually tweak the process, make it as efficient as possible. So maybe you might increase the product to waste ratio here. The next step after that is instead of just letting this waste and going disposing of it, um, and actually uh, losing unreacted product because some of that waste is product, some of it's unreacted feed, and some of it is waste. We'll put a separator system on so any of the unreacted feed can then be fed back and go back through the reactor. So this reduces the amount of waste because otherwise it would have been buried. So now that's reduced the waste, the product comes there. Uh, the next step after that is, so you've got, uh, once you've got this system running, uh, it may be, um, obviously the unreacted feed is, is not drawn there, but it is going back there now. Um, you will end up nonetheless with some waste. Now it may be that uh, you can send that waste off site to somewhere else where they have uh, a different process which your waste becomes their uh, reagent in a reactor to produce a product off site. Obviously the other way of doing this um, if the waste is not uh, possible to make into a product like that then a waste treatment and then you have different waste and again uh, that waste treatment might be a conversion to make it into a product for some other process. Finally um, when one has done all that and reclaimed all the possible products out of the waste and there's absolutely nothing else there then it goes to the landfill. All the time, of course, through each of these stages, you're examining your chemistry, you're improving your reactivity. Ultimately, you have improved it so much that the waste you are producing is actually much smaller or lower or much more innocuous and can be released directly to the environment. So, um, where does this lead? It leads to more products and greater profit. It leads to less waste, less cost, lower environmental footprint. And of course, it means that if you're making more profit, you can invest in higher know-how, for instance, catalytic processes, and hence again, another round of lower costs, improved yield, maybe more specific yield, less waste, etc. Good. Okay. Um, let's now, uh, this is a key to the previous slide. I'm not going to go through it, but actually you can see there what each of those stages um, generates for you. Remember, a waste product well, waste, let's just say waste, is a resource at the wrong place and or at the wrong time. Almost all waste is useful for something. It is a reagent for something. You've just got to find out what. Okay, now I'd like just to think for a moment about something we're going to talk about later. We're going to spend a little while now thinking about waste before we go into a um, the first part of a case study. The cost of waste. Well, we've already talked about the fact that you've bought reagents in, they've cost you a lot of money, and you're either directly or indirectly throwing some of that money away. Um, however, it's a lot more than that. 
there are three areas that we need to think about environmental economic and social so let's start with economic we have the process I was just talking about where you have material loss potentially energy loss maybe lower reactor utilization um, which obviously is going to impact your economic bottom line but also that stuff you can't use that waste has to be disposed of and treated which costs you more energy materials labor capital and costs you more so in terms of your bottom line your economic bottom line which is your cost um, is effectively your bottom line the more waste you have the worse your bottom line will be the more expensive it will be for you to make your product but economic is not the only bottom line this is actually where this is going is something called triple bottom line which is economic social and environment and later in the course we'll talk a little bit more about it but let's now look at the environment side so you have authorized emissions but you have a public attitude to those you have uh, and you need to pay for licenses then you have unauthorized emissions which will cost you more in fines and clean up and trust me there will be a customer and public response if you keep destroying a local river or, or whatever um, your image will suffer and if your image suffers then actually it's going to be harder to sell the cost of this area is going to go up so there's another bottom line which should be just authorized emissions um, and maybe some money spent on helping public attitude to a higher level of expenditures you have to meet these extra expenses and finally your social bottom line there's public perception it's easier to build relationships with regulatory bodies and planners not to say anything of your customer base if you have a good reputation it's easier to get workforce good workforce if you have a good workforce attitude because they're it's based on a good worker good industry reputation etc etc so your costs actually are not just economic although they can be reduced to economic because all of these things can be translated either um, more or less accurately into financial terms so it's no longer just your economic bottom line there are three bottom lines and we'll talk about those a bit later okay staying with waste let's actually look at a cost breakdown um, for making a speciality chemical and remember that there are different um, uh, tiers of the chemical industry so general chemicals is probably produces less waste than speciality which produce less waste than pharmaceuticals anyway here's the numbers um, the cost breakdown for a speciality chemical you've got them here raw materials energy waste is a stonking 37 percent it just it to me is irritating you spend lots of money buying reagents and then put them through and then you spend lots more money throwing those reagents out and then cleaning up after them or, or whatever anyway so more than a third of your cost for a speciality chemical typically is waste okay let's ask where that thir what that 37 splits up to be and 60% of that 37% is materials um, 20% is treatment and disposal of the waste 10% is capital new equipment you have to buy and 10% is labor so it's setting up a part of your company which is going to cost you money which actually you don't really want to set up 
in the bigger sense, if you study Six Sigma or any manufacturing things, this whole economic stream will be called waste. It doesn't contribute to your product, the production of your product. Okay, um, now, we talked about the use of the 12 principles and that they led inexorably to um, reduction and process intensification. Now, we need to, and obviously greening, we need to talk about some of the uh, particular ways, some of the particular techniques of intensification that uh, are used. Uh, and I've got a list here. Now, some of these, for instance, ionic liquids, for instance, supercritical solvents, for instance, catalysts, are subjects of lectures in their own right. Others are going to be studied in as examples in the rest of the module. So I'm not going to deal with them here because it almost uh, it's better to show you their application as examples rather than just stick them all in one place. Okay, the last part of this lecture is uh, part of a case study, which as I mentioned before, will run through various parts of the module. Um, and it's good to use these as examples for what we've been talking about. Um, I'm going to be thinking about the manufacture of biodiesel. Um, now there are four, well, there are more actually, but let's just say there are four general methods for making bio, biodiesel. There's esterification with methanol, typically of triglycerides. That would make you fatty acid methyl ester biodiesel, and the reaction is trans transesterification. <laughs> transesterification. There's the manufacture of um, biodiesel from syngas. That's by using the Fischer-Tropes mechanism. There's manufacture, usually with water cleanup, from algae. That's usually using a, a supercritical water reactor. And there are a number of us of less developed routes. Now, you may notice there is a large A in this slide. I now want to show you, you'll see other letters as well, what they mean, if you like, what the key to them is. I've called this from idea to reality. That is, you have an idea about doing something or making something um, in terms of some sort of uh, manufacturing plant. How do you get from there, which is A, through to reality, I. And so there are a number of stages. You have an idea, typically a business idea, what is missing, what is needed, um, and you identify a particular solution, B. You make sure you know the chemistry, C. Identify the stages, the processes that you would need to do that chemistry. Then E, write the initial box process diagram. And then the rest here, plant design, costings, obviously an outline business case. Then the formal after experiments, PFS detail. Um, so you've been running a pilot plant here to get the numbers for your PFS. And then detail plant design of the main plant. Okay. So when you see A, B, C, D or whatever in the corner of a slide or maybe down here in a big letter, you know it's referring to one of these particular stages. OK, so this is A. You've had an idea uh, that maybe there could be um, biofuels, money to be made or environmental good things to happen uh, by using biofuels. So a little bit of background, just on liquid fuels, um, diesel, uh, as you're prob probably aware, 
Um, it's usually taken as C16, or it will be in this case, and is mostly. It's distilled crude fraction, and the details are there. Um, biodiesel, the type we're going to be talking about, fame, fatty acid, methyl ester, C12 to C22, at 90%, 16 to 18. All of these fuels have different advantages and disadvantages. And in, certainly in terms of energy, one of the problems with all of the sort of uh, biofuels and things like that are that diesel, um, petrol, they're damn good fuels already. And so most of the, mostly biodiesel, at least modern biodiesel, oh, sorry, sorry, current biodiesel has lower energy input than its fossil uh, counterpart. Ethanol, which is a part petrol substitute, has lower energy than its uh, fossil substitute. And the chemical properties of the various fuels cause different problems for their use. You can't just usually make biodiesel or roll up at a factory and fill up your Jeep with it or something. Um, there are a whole load of issues um, to do with engine guarantees, which means you have blend walls. Don't worry about those now, we'll talk about them in a later part of the case study. For ethanol and petrol, the very fact that ethanol can dissolve water means that you're producing water into your petrol engine, which has its own problems. Right, okay, so that was background. Let's now brief ourselves. So typically fossil diesel, C16, that's a, a linear alkane example. The fame biodiesel here, uh, and it's got the methyl ester uh, on the end of it. So that's that's fine. Um, okay. Now, what's the chemistry? So we're at B at the moment in our uh, little set of um, letters. C is know the chemistry. Okay, it's a, so you have a triglyceride. Typically, um, it's an animal fat. And what you do is you use a base catalyst and use methanol. And effectively, you break bonds here and you end up with the each of the strands then as a methyl ester. So this is one of the strands. And you get three strands per molecule, triglyceride three. And the skeleton, the glycerol, or the sorry, the um, three carbon skeleton, you end up with the triple hydroxy, the glycerol. Now, uh, let's just briefly look at the mechanism of that. Okay, here it is. This is the general base catalyzed transesterification uh, mechanism. And basically the alkali abstracts a proton from the alcohol producing an alkoxide anion. Um, and in this case it is because we're dealing with methanol. Um, and you can see the process here where the carbonyl compound of the carbonyl of the original uh, starting ester uh, is uh, attacked nucleophilically by the incoming alkoxide. You get the tetrahedral intermediate and then finally um, you either get transesterification um, or uh, it reverts back to the starting material, depending on conditions. Okay, so C, know your chemistry. Let's just think about how this process stacks up using the uh, environmental metrics we've just been looking at. So our reactants are effectively animal fat, methanol, and the potassium hydroxide is recoverable at the end, uh, so it doesn't really count as a catalyst. Um, what are our products? Now, this is important. We certainly get the biodiesel. Provided you count glycerol as a product, 
then effectively your atom efficiency is pretty much 100%. Um, and because we're dealing with mass, you know, the same atoms on a mass, there are no waste streams. In fact, most of your other indices are the lowest or highest possible. They're all very good. So this is a very environmental um, type of process. But let's just come back to glycerol for a second. Um, let's just look at how much glycerol typically is produced. Um, uh, yeah, uh, how much methanol is actually reduced, uh, taken from the the glycerol and the biodiesel. Uh, you'll see more in a moment. Hang on. Okay, so there's a reference at the bottom of the next slide which will give you some numbers for the overall process, um, although it depends how you run it as to what you get out. But this is really looking at the two main products, glycerol and biodiesel, and looking at the amount of methanol recovered from them. We're going to look at the process in a second and you're going to see the different stages. But it's quite stunning in one sense that something which is a, a, a side product, although with modern fame plants, it's now a major product because there are markets for glycerol. How it also is really, really useful in scrubbing up unreacted reagent, which can then be recycled back into the process. Okay, and there's the reference I talked about that has uh, some actual numbers from a plant that uh, these guys were running to, to do exactly this. Okay, what I'm now going to do is, and notice that we're in D, uh, we have to look at the next stage in our process, which is um, what are the processes we need to do this, to, to take our triglyceride and our methanol and convert it into biodiesel. Now what I've done here, these actually are stages of a, a portable uh, mini plant to do this. But it's convenient to use these graphics and uh, okay. So here's the first stage and you've uh, basically, you've got to dry the uh, triglyceride and filter it, so you don't have any lumps of bone or anything in it. Um, or in this case, vegetable oil. Uh, so basically you need to heat it and circulate it to evaporate any moisture and allow it to cool. The solids settle to the bottom and you can drain them off. So that's the first stage. The second stage is to do the chemistry and to cut that glycerol backbone from the triglyceride to produce your uh, fame and your glycerol. So effectively this is uh, this is where the business happens basically. This is where the reaction happens and you end up, uh, you heat it, leave it overnight, uh, the glycerol is more dense, it will sink to the bottom, so you have a two layer uh, uh, system left in there, both of which are products. If glycerol were not a product, glycerol would then be a waste product. Uh, nonetheless, the chemistry to get rid of it will be the same but the economics would look rather different. Okay, the third stage, we've got unreacted methanol in here, which was the diagram I just showed you about the amount of methanol dissolved in each of those. You have to get rid of it. So effectively you heat it up such and circulate such that the methanol in both phases will um, evaporate and you can then remove it pump it out, remove it and condense it, and then use it, recycle it as a reactant. So that's all good. Uh, finally, you need to remove the catalyst and um, any remaining traces of glycerol because uh, once you've removed the um, methanol, you can simply uh, uh, separate the two immiscible layers. So you now mist water into the biodiesel. Um, the uh, 
Uh, potassium hydroxide is soluble in the water. The glycerol is soluble in the water. The biodiesel isn't particularly. So effectively, um, you clean your biodiesel and you remove any other traces of glycerol and you remove all of your catalyst, your potassium hydroxide. Okay, so uh, now you've removed um, everything uh, you need to. You can heat the biodiesel one last time to remove any water vapour because you remember you've just effectively extracted it with water and this is one of the reasons I've shown you this. In a lab you might know what you do but it's easier to say well okay yeah I've got to wash it with water but how do I do that? Well this is the type of system you'd use to do it. Likewise for distillation and, and the other things. Um, right and when you've done all that and then uh, hot air driven off any final elements of water vapour you end up with your clean bright biodiesel ready to use. Okay let's now go to the next stage E you need to design your uh, flow diagram your process flow diagram now there's no numbers on here at the moment but looking at this there you've got your alcohol recovery loop you've got your um, fatty acid removal system uh, so you can get your glycerin out you can get your biodiesel out in separate streams note how much of this is purification uh, and in this diagram you've decided that your filter and um, dry your alcohol and your vegetable oil before you put it in there's no plant to do that in this diagram okay so you're now at F, you're actually designing the plant. You assume that you've done your previous pilot uh, plant stuff and you can then work at uh, building this in small scale. Make sure it works before you scale it up to a full, full scale plant. Right, okay, that's all we're gonna do now for now on the biofuels case study. Um, what's going to happen is more bits of this case study are going to appear um, at different points in the module as we build up the whole picture. Anyway, you'll be glad to know. I think that's the end. So thank you very much and uh, thank you for listening. Take care. Bye bye.